the first um, uh, challenges that we are facing at the region has to do with the management of uh, political uh, transitions. Now, what is important to note here is that uh, uh, nearly all, if not all, uh, EGAD member states are uh, dealing with political transition in one way or the other, be it uh, from peace processes or elections. Uh, but these issues um, are uh, around uh, finding attempts to find political consensus, uh, issues around addressing um, historical injustices or managing economic and uh, social uh, demographics. Uh, they recently, we are dealing with the issues around uh, uh, um, climate change and, and now, much as the COVID has ended, but then there is a, a, the aftermath of, of, of COVID issues. Uh, the second cluster of uh, uh, challenges that we are facing as a region has to do with governance and demographic gaps. Uh, so those the transitional challenges I mentioned earlier uh, are linked generally, and they also overlap with the, with the governance and democratic uh, distortions. Here, I would want to just highlight uh, the election management as a key issue, and most of the elections being contested. Um, and then there's also this issue around uh, center periphery contestation where most of the borderlands feel uh, neglected. But sometimes also you find this also within uh, the, 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 the member states. Uh, within this also, there is a management and distribution of natural resources, who gets what. And this normally leads to uh, contestations uh, around um, diversities, be it ethnic, religious, or gender. Now, uh, one thing that is now currently alive in the region is uh, the, the, the stagflation. Uh, this, which is characterized by uh, the region is undergoing slow economic growth. We are talking about uh, currencies that are uh, devaluing with this, uh, high food prices, uh, higher taxation, et cetera. So all these things are actually now playing uh, together to create uh, some kind of a uh, 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 a complex uh, situation. Uh, and the third uh, clustering that I thought I, I should share is about uh, institutional responses to address those two key issues. Uh, and what we can say here is uh, much as the institutions are getting stronger, but they are still not sufficiently responsive. But again, we wouldn't want uh, to put a sweeping statement uh, in this way, uh, because again, uh, it varies from one country to the other. Uh, and within this, uh, we are talking about things like uh, the, the, the judiciary uh, trying to struggle with arbitrating some of the election outcomes or uh, the, uh, the interplay between other branches of government. We have parliament that sometimes uh, get blamed for going closer to the executive. Uh, we also have issues around um, the law enforcement agencies sometimes uh, being blamed for some excesses. So. Uh, we can't talk about uh, challenges uh, in the region without also looking at uh, what is happening elsewhere. So all these actually are happening within the context of global multipolarity. And uh, the key one now is uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and that of course has strategic uh, uh, impact uh, for the Horn of Africa, but coupled with that, there is uh, increasing, uh, what we see as increasing geopolitical interests. Uh, among first the superpowers themselves, and then between the superpowers and the emerging powers in the in the horn. Uh, and recent now entry into this is the information technology, which much as it's good, but it's also now becoming like a source of tension. Um, uh, in some cases, it uh, gets politicized and distorted. Uh, it has been used in other cases to widen uh, social divisions. But more important also to note is that the increase in cyber crimes, which uh, in most cases targets uh, uh, the, the young people. So if you look at what the picture that I've painted, you will realize that uh, when all these things come together, what we see in the region, you'll find a number of violent conflict situations. Uh, we are talking about food insecurity, humanitarian emergencies, uh, the issues around radicalization and violent extremism, and, and you can continue listing that. Uh, it would also not be good really to conclude this by only presenting you this kind of a picture, but we also need to take note that uh, a lot of efforts are being made uh, by the national governments as well as the regional bodies to address some of these threats 
including uh, through uh, institutional processes like uh, uh, the summits, uh, the councils meeting, like recently we had, a can we have actually had two uh, council meeting on Sudan uh, in the last two months. Uh, we've had, a, we had had summits too, but we have also had council, council of ministers meeting on Sudan recently. There are also uh, bilateral arrangements uh, between uh, uh, countries to address uh, transnational organized crime, but there's also an element of uh, integrated programming uh, uh, that we are undertaking. Um, so uh, some of the efforts that uh, we are putting in place uh, are, uh, are this one, but of course, many can be said. All I wanted to stress is that uh, the situation is not hopeless. Yes, we have the threats, but uh, there are also mechanisms that are in place to address them. Uh, and so uh, the next question that you asked is now, what is the role of uh, an EGAD while early warning system in, in managing these threats? So uh, first, let me uh, bank this by saying that early warning as we perceive it is about persuasion. Eh? Uh, it's about persuading uh, decision makers on the validity of some claims that we make about uh, a possible um, uh, harmful future. Uh, in our case, this would be an emergence or escalation of uh, violent conflicts. So much of our work is, is more on the conflict prevention uh, part. Um, then, now being cognizant that uh, some of these threats uh, don't know the, uh, the national state established uh, the, its early warning system uh, with the uh, main purpose of uh, creating a mechanism for consultation and cooperation among member states, but also between member states and uh, other stakeholders to pass, to settle uh, disputes peacefully, but also to address uh, common threats. So in terms of our contribution to addressing this, uh, and this is uh, coded in our protocol, uh, we do on the one side anticipatory analysis. So we engage with these uh, uh, threats and uh, we do analysis, we generate scenarios, et cetera like we just did one, I think a month ago, we are still uh, uh, refining that conf the profile. But the second is uh, also once we've do we done that, then we inform the decision makers on what we see as possible ways to address this goal, these threats. So that's actually the main, our main contribution into this. Um, and so we deploy uh, both detective capabilities uh, for data capture analysis, uh, and also we have response capabilities that we not only do as uh, the conflict early warning system, but also we do jointly with other IGAD divisions and specialized uh, institution offices so of the special envoys, et cetera. Um, in terms of uh, the difference between early warning and uh, intelligence system, uh, there's a thin line here, uh, but there are also a lot of And, and intelligence system tend to differ. The first one is that uh, intelligence system, as far as the focus, the first one is focus. Uh, and intelligence systems uh, seem to be focusing more on the threats for the na of national security. And, and by those who are doing, I think they focus more on uh, their lens, is on enemy lens, uh, looking at the other as the enemy. And uh, the information also is shared in terms of uh, the need to know. The second area that I would talk to is about actors. Um, in early warning uh, systems, it, it tends to be more open, inclusive uh, of diverse stakeholders that are used uh, either as information sources or analysts or responders. On the other side of uh, intelligence, uh, it, it tends to be more closed and it tends also to rely a lot on indiv trusted individuals as well as uh, uh, groups. Uh, the third categorization of what I see as a, a difference is uh, how we relate with the decision makers. Um, intelligence systems, you know, they belong to the governments. So it, they are more of uh, what is called the inside up warners, or, uh, warners in the sense that they are within the structure and some of the, the decision makers they are informing are within but then you have early warning system, which is more of um, outside in. Uh, this institution that are outside, but are supporting the government in, uh, in, uh, with additional information. So this you find, for example, the regional 
uh, early warnings of regional economic communities as well as uh, in NGOs, etc. Um, so this actually forms the basis upon which uh, C1, uh, which is the conflict early warning mechanism of uh, EGAD was established, basically to, uh, to play a complementary role in the state uh, intelligence system. Uh, we understand that these two need to be mutually reinforcing because from our region, we believe that uh, there's a lot of credence that you can get when institutions with divergent mandates uh, like uh, uh, the, the regional mechanism uh, and the intelligence system of the member state, when they agree uh, on, on, in, on some information, and I think you are getting a lot of uh, believability of, uh, of the information you are sharing. Now, uh, on the issue of a closer working relationship between the early warning, the regional early warning systems, to bridge uh, the early warning, early response gap, the first thing I want to say here is that uh, there is a growing appreciation uh, of the role of conflict prevention, and of course, studies have been done to this extent, including the role of conflict early warning in it. But still, uh, the decision makers uh, seem to under-resource the conflict prevention, but uh, on the other side, uh, they also fail sometimes to act on uh, what we would call from early warning side, abundance of, of warnings. And I think this is what constitutes the early warning, early, uh, early, early, early action gap. And I wanted to share with you what I think are four ingredients of this gap. First has to do with uh, the knowledge and the rigors of uh, doing uh, generating knowledge including differentiating something that is very close, but they're different. Uh, what are the indicators as opposed to the warning itself? Where warning is a judgment that you make on the possible deterioration of a situation. Uh, and so uh, for us, what we see is that to say that a warning has happened, it has to go uh, through four key areas. One is the attention of the decision maker will have been uh, raised. Two, that the decision maker has accepted uh, uh, the, the warning, and three, even if they have accepted, have they prioritized it uh, for action? And four, you can prioritize, but have you uh, mobilized for action? Have you acted on it? So until you go through the four, you will, uh, the early warning will be suspended either, either way. Uh, the second uh, um, uh, ingredient I see is about communication. And, and what we struggle with in early warning, sometimes we are on the continuum of either being too confident about our prediction, which sometimes is not good when you're dealing with social sciences or social issues uh, on the one side, and then sometimes we try to be cautious. So you'll find such statements around likely will happen, uh, uh, maybe, or this kind of statement. And that, of course, has its implications. The third is the big one, which is the political will or the motivational bias, or if you wish, uh, political consideration. What is important to know here is that uh, at any time, a decision has to, a decision maker has to uh, undertake a lot of trade-offs in terms of uh, what to act on. So it could be about relevance of the information or how do you check that against accuracy of the information uh, the issues around short-term and long-term implication of uh, the information. Uh, also, how do you uh, balance between the bureaucratic and uh, political uh, priorities uh, that the, the, the governments might be having? And of course, the cost of either acting or not acting. So this actually inform whether decision makers will be able to act on early warning or not. The, third, the fourth, the fourth uh, ingredient, uh, which is the last ingredient on, uh, on this gap, is the feedback that uh, people on the other side of uh, early warning keep raising that uh, there is very insufficient or uh, lack of, of, of feedback that can help them affect uh, their work. So if you wish, the gap between warning and action is uh, respectively just a gap between those who do early warning and those who do uh, response or action, uh, and while we agree that uh, um, they need to keep a professional gap between them, uh, we also believe that uh, they need to be a, a, a healthy relationship between the two entities for early warning uh, to be done, uh, according to the, those four areas that I mentioned. So in terms of bridging the gap, uh, I think uh, I also have uh, uh, two areas that I think we can do. Uh, 
uh, and especially for regional early warning mechanisms working together. The first is uh, about uh, strengthening the credibility of the sources and the rigors of analysis. And the, the key thing here is about uh, strengthening triangulation uh, on the information that we are getting. Uh, and, and in this, I believe the regional early warning system can uh, continue. They have started, but they can continue or strengthen uh, engagement in joint analysis, joint scenario building. Like when we're doing our scenario building in May, we invited other, other regional uh, early warning mechanism to contribute. Uh, they can also harmonize their indicators, and we do a lot through uh, cross-learning. Uh, but all this, I think, is to strengthen the believability of uh, the data and analysis that uh, we, we generate. And the second, of course, is related with what I was saying earlier about uh, trying to strengthen the persuasiveness of our warning. Uh, what I want us to note here is uh, uh, that warning, especially on violent conflicts, tends to be very disruptive. Um, they are political in many ways, and in, in, in a number of cases, they can also be perceived. When you give a warning, it can be perceived like a policy or an action failure. And that has an implication that perhaps the person that you are warning uh, could be implicated uh, by the same warning you are giving. So how do you really ensure that you persuade uh, this, that decision maker uh, in a better way? And here uh, I see that uh, the early warning uh, mechanisms can undertake again joint briefings, they can do uh, common uh, messaging, and we can actually learn from what we see happening by uh, the election observation groups. Because in most cases, either they cross-check their findings or you'll find them doing joint briefing. The purpose is to strengthen their persuasiveness that we have a common understanding. And I think this is something we can be able to do. Uh, but now uh, uh, this also uh, has something to do with the strength and the sufficiency, sufficiency of uh, the knowledge that we generate. I think the final question, and I hope I can do it in two minutes that I have, is uh, how can African uh, uh, governments and security sector leaders like uh, the, the participants leverage the early warning to deliver safety and security to the citizen? Um, the key thing here is, uh, and I've tried to allude to this, is that uh, in social issues like what we are dealing with, it is highly unlikely that you will be able to have sufficient knowledge. In fact, for early warning, uh, I hear people talking about if you're able to do 45%, then I think you are doing very well. So what does that really mean uh, uh, to the, the government? What does that mean to security sector leaders? I think what we would expect from the security sector leaders and the African government is to support these early warning systems to strengthen the reliability from 45 to maybe 70. Uh, and this they can do by tapping into the, the knowledge that is out there uh, uh, with the what we are calling the outside inside warners. Um, and uh, within context, of course, uh, I think uh, what we would and, uh, expect from the, 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 the leaders is more of cultivating familiarity between uh, those who do the warning and those who do the, the, the action, including yourselves. Uh, and this you can do by, for example, creating uh, permanent briefers, those who can brief you permanently so that you understand each other. But you can also support by enhancing opportunities for interaction. Because this tool will help, one, uh, uh, the, the owners to know what information is use, useful to you and decision makers. It can also help uh, the owners know how and when to share information, but also understand some of the constraints that uh, the, 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 the decision makers would be having to act. And uh, I want to mention that uh, from IGAD's side, I think the early warning system of IGAD was designed in such a way that it is able to, uh, the structures actually allow this interaction at all levels from the grassroots to the regional level. So uh, finally, uh, in terms of uh, takeaway, and uh, I would, uh, of course, uh, I know that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the room, we have people who can advocate. So these are the things that I believe we can, you can help advocate for us to strengthen the early warning uh, mechanism of the regional organizations. One is to strategically place early warning systems within or closer to decision-making structures. And I think uh, ECOWAN uh, is leading on this, but the rest of us can be able to also do that. 
Second is about re retooling the early warnings. You know, based on those complexity of conflicts, conflicts and threats that we're experiencing, we need really to continuously adapt our early warning system to be able to capture all uh, the, the threats that uh, uh, we are facing. Third is about response analysis, that we need to strengthen integrating response analysis in our, our early warning systems so that uh, it's not just early warning, then response, and so what. We had to ask ourselves whether the response was adequate, or if not, what can we do better? Third is to strengthen and support, actually, use of technology in early warning. Some governments tend to be very hesitant on use of uh, uh, technologies, machine learning, intelligence, uh, uh, how do you call it, artificial intelligence, drones, etc. But these are becoming very important instruments, and we wish, actually, that this can be uh, strengthened. And of course, the use of peace funds, uh, the governments really need to put in uh, money, not just the development partners, but also government into some of the peace funds because it allows for quicker action. And finally is on the ownership. Uh, we would really uh, hope that uh, the members just fully own uh, this uh, uh, regional early warning system by putting in resources that would be required by listening to them by perfecting them and correcting where it can be done.